Well, it's good to to uh, to be on on this uh, uh, project and and talk to you. Generally speaking, uh, just uh, two three sentences historically, and then we'll go uh, uh, towards uh, our time and the present uh, realities. Uh, as you probably know, the main uh, force that uh, created the Zionist project from its very inception until the creation of the state in 1948 was the labor Zionist uh, movement. Uh, could be defined as social democratic, but of course has to be uh, uh, contextualized within its uh, uh, colonialist uh, nature. So it's, it was its socialist democratic towards the, the Jewish settlers who came uh, to Palestine and the next generation of Jewish settlers, and of course, not much of the either the socialism or the democracy uh, was directed towards the native people of Palestine, the Palestinians. Uh, with the years, the Labour Party uh, was much more of kind of a right wing social democratic uh, uh, party, and again, I, I I qualify it by saying that this is uh, in its policies towards the Jewish. Uh, society in Israel. Uh, in 1977, uh, they lost their uh, predominant position in Israeli politics, and the Likud came to power. The Likud was uh, a kind of an alliance between an old Zionist movement that tended to be more nationalist, more capitalist, one can say, in its uh, economic uh, perceptions, and a bit more racist probably uh, and Zionist than the Labour Party uh, and um, uh, it joined forces with uh, liberal Zionists and, and other uh, figures like uh, General Ariel Sharon who actually came from the Labour Party uh, and they they more or less uh, dominate Israeli uh, politics from 1977 until today there were, we don't have time to go into it, there were phases when the Likud was less uh, strong, uh, uh, when central parties were able to attract some uh, uh, support from the Israeli uh, electorate. But all in all, uh, if we look at the development of Israeli politics from the beginning of the 21st century until today, the whole shift is towards the right. Right in Israeli terms is both capitalism, but far more important in terms of its policies towards the Palestinians, wherever they are, whether it's the Palestinian minority in Israel or the Palestinians in the uh, uh, occupied West Bank and the occupied Gaza Strip until 2007. Uh, the shift to the right, to a more fundamentalist, racist, uh, colonialist uh, uh, policies towards the Palestinians and also towards a more religious theocratic kind of Israel accelerated uh, in the last three years and uh, came to a peak in the November 22 elections when a coalition of the Likud with more extreme right-wing uh, uh, groups that until then were quite on the margin of Israeli politics and who were born in the settler communities in the West Bank um, messianic Zionist uh, fundamentalist uh, uh, group uh, with a very extreme uh, uh, view on on the situation with the uh, uh, open advocation for transfer of Palestinians and ruthless uh, policies uh, towards them. These groups that used to be on the margin in the last three years moved to the center of politics in Israel. Um, what is interesting that after the November 22, elections and just up to the 7th of October 2023 until Operation uh, Al-Aqsa flood uh, 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 erupted, uh, until that point uh, Israel was deteriorating into a kind of a civil war between uh, two groups. Uh, I, I described one group as the state of Judea. This is the, the this is the the camp that was born, as I mentioned, in the settlements in the occupied territories, fighting for a much less democratic Israel, not not in terms of the Palestinians, but in terms even of the Jewish population, less democratic, more theocratic, uh, and more fundamentalist and racist. 
And against it stood the state, like what I call the state of Israel or the old state of Israel, this kind of liberal Zionism that wants a pluralistic open life, but doesn't mind the occupation. Uh, uh, so so the, the, the kind of common ground is to maintain an apartheid Israel, but the question was what kind of an, a, a Jewish society it will be. Um, uh, this seemed to be over for for a month when the, the war started in, in Gaza, but we can see now the signs of this uh, civil war coming coming back. You can call it called civil war, so that people will not be misinformed here. There is no fighting yet, but it was it was taken on the streets uh, as well. As for your question about uh, an anti-Zionist left, well, that's a very interesting. From the very beginning of Zionism, there were anti-Jewish, anti-Zionist Jews, also including the Jewish community in Palestine and later in the state of Israel. They were also very, very much on the margin. Uh, they had no impact on Israeli policies uh, from above. I think their main importance was in their connection with the Palestinians and uh, with the international uh, uh, community. Um, they don't appear in any more in official parties in Israel, but you can find them in small pockets in the Israeli uh, Jewish civil society. Uh, and uh, it's a younger generation, uh, and its fortune really depends not so much on its own power to change politics from the inside in Israel, but rather on the ability of the region and the world to force Israel uh, to change. Uh, so this is more or less the, the situation. Well, yeah, this uh, that what we we uh, and I was one of them. What we used to call the new historians, namely Israeli academics, who uh, accepted chapters of the Palestinian narrative of 1948, and some academics that even went further than just looking at 48, but you know, on Zionism altogether. I think most of them have either left the country in 2000 or uh, did a U-turn. So I don't think that you'll find many, there probably is one or two of them in academia. It's not, they're not totally absent, but it's far more difficult for them. And, and for me, it was difficult enough <laughs> when I was there, but uh, it's far more difficult for them even than it was for me. So uh, uh, they, ha they, they hardly have a chance or an opportunity either to write, research or teach in any uh, ways that contradicts the mainstream Zionist uh, narrative in Israel today. Uh, most of them are outside of Israel, but I think that kind of uh, critical impulse, namely to question the very essence of Zionism, uh, the behavior of 1948 and so on, has moved into small groups in the civil society. Uh, so it's there that you find the challenge uh, much more than uh, in the academia today. Yes, I, I do think they are important because uh, when I introduced the term ethnic cleansing in 2007, I, I was aware that I'm introducing a, a concept that is both moral, political, and legal. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think it makes a lot of difference when you uh, describe a certain act as self-defense or you describe it as ethnic cleansing. Uh, as we know from uh, the uh, situation in the the previous, uh, in ex-Yugoslavia, acts of ethnic cleansing uh, 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 eventually led to uh, uh, to people being uh, uh, brought to trial, and also in, uh, in, in Africa. Of course, the West is very careful not to judge itself or, on its own history of ethnic cleansing, but that's another story. So I think, yes, the, these terms are, are significant, uh, and um, there is now, much more than before, quite a good uh, uh, literature in international law and in moral philosophy uh, that helps us to define, to, to see whether our accusations are based on facts and not just, you know, because we, we are angry with someone or feel that there is an unjust action taking place. And because this is also easy nowadays, to solidify with academic research. And in certain cases, you can use experts on international law to help you 
uh, uh, make a good case also in uh, legal tribunals, I think it makes a difference. I, I know that the problem here is that while there were some successes uh, in the past in uh, suing uh, 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 Israel on certain issues that pertain to, to ethnic cleansing, like the, the apartheid wall that Israel built, uh, and uh, uh, who knows, maybe now in, in the ICJ uh, about apartheid, I think the problem for many Palestinians, especially Palestinians who still live in Palestine, and definitely also for the Palestinian refugees who hope to return to Palestine, is that so far these uh, uh, rulings have not changed even a bit the reality on the ground. Uh, whereas in other cases, if you think about it, uh, some of these rulings did change realities on the ground. So. Uh, while we uh, should pay a lot of attention and respect for these uh, uh, right definition and right reframing, and uh, what I called in a book with Noam Chomsky, uh, the right uh, dictionary to use when we talk about Palestine, we should be aware that one of the reasons that uh, in uh, uh, the, the right words or the right terminology, whether it's legal, moral, or political, is not having an effect on the reality on the ground is because of a certain exceptionalism uh, and immunity that Israel enjoys. So if you want to understand the importance on the one hand of these framing, but on the other hand, the limitation of these framing, you have also to deconstruct and analyze why Israel in 2023 still enjoys such an exceptional immunity uh, compared to many other countries uh, in the world. I wasn't surprised, I must say. I mean, uh, uh, any uh, anyone who, who knows the history of uh, the Zionist lobby in the United States on the one hand, and the American imperialist policies in the region, or the history of American, imperialist history. Uh, on the other hand, uh, would not have expected the United States to behave in any, any any other different way, and it didn't really matter whether it was a Democratic uh, president or a, a Republican president. Uh, the lobby uh, in the United States, well, by the way, which is not just a Jewish lobby, there's a very, very strong Christian Zionist lobby in America, and there's a lobby of the military industrial complex in America. I mean, the, the lobby for Israel in America is standing on, on a stool that is made of three three legs, uh, the Zionist law, the Jewish lobby, the Christian Zionist lobby, and the military industrial complex and the security uh, uh, industry as well. So so this is, these are powerful uh, forces that are at work for more than a century now, more than 100 years. So uh, when when the lobby is that old, it means that it doesn't have to work all the time. There's already an inertia, namely politicians know exactly that they should not challenge the lobby. The lobby doesn't even have to tell them that after uh, three or four generations of politicians already exposed to that kind of work. So, so the, the, the American support for Israel will take time to uh, dwindle. It will, by the way. I'm, I'm quite optimistic about it, but I think it's it's not yet there. Uh, so, so I wasn't surprised uh, by it. Uh, every every time that America does it, uh, there are surprises, if you want, on the level of stupidity of some of the expressions of the American policymaker. For example, when uh, President Biden says, "I'm I'm a Zionist," you, you have to, someone has to remind him that he's not a Zionist president. I mean, there is a World Zionist Organization that is looking for a president, he can go there, but he's not a Zionist president, he's an American president. Or when uh, the Secretary of State Blinken said, in a situation like this, I'm a Jew, he's undermining 100 years of attempts of American Jews to show, to, to convince people that there is no dual loyalty of American Jews. Uh, so you, you, you can see the uh, uh, particularities for every such event, but but the big picture the big picture is that america is not yet ready to uh, uh cease to be the main uh, shield the immunity shield for israel's impunity on the ground we should 
be aware that there are strong undercurrents in the American society, especially in the younger generation, including, including in the younger Jewish generation, that uh, uh, has a great potential to change American policy in the future. The people who are now marching in solidarity uh, with Palestine, uh, some of them come from socioeconomic background that ensures that in the future there might be the policy makers. So uh, uh, this, we, sh we should not take a deterministic view of this American uh, uh, unconditional support for Israel, but one should not be surprised by it in 2023 in a year of election. Yes, thanks. And uh, you said that you're, you're optimistic that this will change. So this is because of those currents that are fighting the mainstream pro-Israel, or you think because of more geopolitical changes that the U.S. might be a bit more concerned, for example, with uh, the, the let's say the Chinese bloc and the more Asian conflicts and trying to retreat a little bit from the Middle East? Yes, I, I think there are other processes that show that America would not forever be the predominant power here in the region. Uh, one, so one of them, I think, is the, the, the civil society that has strong undercurrents that are not necessarily against American involvement in the world, but they want a very different American involvement uh, in the world on the side of, of the, the oppressed and the colonized. That's one, one process. The other one is from people who are more cynical about the troubles of other people, but more isolationist in 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 uh, in, in their orientation. Uh, you can find them in the Republican Party, and, and these are people who who understand that America has huge social, financial, cultural problems, uh, and uh, it doesn't deal with them sometimes because of its expansionist, imperialist policies. And therefore, I think this is also a movement that one should pay attention to that would demand, uh, first of all, a more introverted American uh, po uh, policy looking inside, but also would be concerned about the money that such an American policy uh, requires. Uh, and then what you mentioned is very important. I, I think this uh, new uh, axis uh, of uh, different powers uh, whether it's China, uh, Brazil, uh, uh, South Africa, uh, uh, other uh, powers in the global south uh, uh, are uh, definitely going to challenge the American hegemony. And when it comes to Palestine or the Arab Muslim world, they have a very different view on, on what should be taken there. And, 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 and I think we should not uh, forget that um, there is... There always is a potential. It's not always fulfilled, but there's always still a potential for what we used to call the left, because I'm not entirely sure what the left today is anymore, unfortunately, and I say it as a leftist. Um, but I think there is a potential now for redefining the left as, as a new association, not just between trade unions, which was the old dogma, but between trade unions and intersectional, uh, that should be involved in an intersectional alliance with Native Americans, with the Zapatista in, in, in Mexico, with, with minorities whose rights are being uh, denied because of their religious or ethnic identity, like the Muslims in Kashmir. Uh, I, I think this is, there is a potential there of building a very powerful global alliance that would have, a, to my mind, a very positive impact, uh, not just on Palestine, but on the Arab world as a whole. I think change is, is, uh, is a matrix. Uh, it's a fusion of discrete processes that they meet together and then they create this powerful change. So definitely uh, uh, the Palestinian national movement is still there. The Palestinian resistance is still there. Uh, and uh, it's very difficult, of course, to carry out this resistance under the oppression, uh, uh, but uh, it, it is always there. And uh, the chances, for instance, for a third uprising in the West Bank are still very high, especially if the Israeli operation uh, in the Gaza Strip uh, will continue with the same uh, cruelty and force that it has done uh, so far. And we still don't know what 
what does it mean? What does what was the situation? What what the situation on the northern border of Israel would entail? Namely, what would be the the reaction of Hezbollah for a continued genocide in Gaza and so on? So definitely, no, no, there are internal uh, importance uh, powers within the Palestinian community uh, that would play, I, I believe, would play a very important role in changing the reality in the future. Uh, we have to remember that the Palestinian society is, is one of the youngest in the world, and we still haven't seen the younger generation of Palestine. When I say Palestine, I mean all over Palestine and all over the Palestinian communities. They haven't yet organized and jailed into a new kind of uh, organization, but I believe this will happen, and that it will play a very important role. But the balance of power, the balance of military power, political power, economic power is such that this cannot succeed without uh, a change both in the Arab world and in uh, the global north. Now, what, what I was referring to is to the fact that there is a two different kind of global realities. One is the global realities of governments, multinational community, uh, companies, uh, security uh, uh, in industries, and so on which one can call global Israel, which supports uh, Israel and, and gives it immunity. But there's also global Palestine, the kind of alliances we have just talked about. Now, the gap between the position of governments, both in the global south and in the global north and in the Arab world, the gap between the position of the political elites and the position of the uh, civil society is very, is very uh, wide. Uh, when it comes to, to to Palestine, for instance, and, and therefore, if there are, and I think there are chances for uh, uh, further revolutions, both in the Arab world and also in, in in political revolutions in the global north, each chain, even if it's not a huge revolution, if, if it's just uh, a transformation of the balance of power or the way politics is being done and so on, each such change, if it doesn't go to the right, it doesn't go to, uh, towards dictatorship. An authoritarian, if it goes in another direction, is a boost for the liberation of Palestine, and is a boost for for enhancing that liberation, because that liberation is connected so strongly not only to national collective rights, but also to indiv to uh, individual civil uh, and human rights. Thank you, Dr. Ben. Well, I'm, I'm not uh, an international jurist, so it's difficult for me to properly assess. What I understand is, looking at the composition of the judges, that there is a likelihood for a temporary injunction, uh, which means that the process would not mature, would not be exhausted, but the court has the right to ask Israel uh, to suspend its action pending a decision. Namely, that there's enough evidence for a good case to for the court to continue a uh, discussion. This, I think, is a likely, uh, not, I, I don't know if it will happen, but it, it, it is a possible, it is a possible um, uh, outcome. The problem is that whether it's a, a, a temporary injunction to stop or it's the end of the process where Israel is really, uh, 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 you know, accused of, of, of genocide, uh, which will take, by the way, a long time. This will take uh, more than uh, two or three years to complete in the ICG. Um, that uh, these, uh, eventually to make these decision, uh, decision with power to change, they have to go through the Security Council of the United Nations, and we know what will happen there. So that's also something important. But of course, I, I, I think it's a very important move uh, uh, to try and do that. Yeah, well, it's a good question, very hard to know. Bengbir, by the way, is not only distributing arms uh, in the West Bank, he's distributing freely arms to every Israeli Jewish citizen. So it's a, it's a far more dangerous move than just, uh, I mean, it's dangerous enough to arm the settlers, but now every second Israeli man has, has no uh, weapons. Um, yes, this is a recipe for a chaos. So, uh, and I think you're right, it, it creates, it disintegrates a, a state, it, it implodes a state from within when it militarizes uh, its own society. And it goes together with other indication that uh, probably this whole project of 
of a Zionist Jewish state is not holding water, uh, not so much because of the resistance to it, which of course is very important, but also because of its uh, internal paradoxes or contradictions uh, 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 that have the potential to implode from within. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, while if you look at the Israeli economy in macroeconomic terms, you can say, okay, it's quite a success story, even in the OECD. But if you look at microeconomics, which is much more important than macroeconomics, uh, microeconomics, you can see that Israel, the, 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 the gap between the have and have nots in Israel has never been as wide as it is, or high as it is now. Uh, very few people can afford buying a house. Uh, many more people find themselves below the, the poverty line in Israel than ever before. Um, if you add to this the huge expenditure of the operation in Gaza so far, and the fact that it created an, a, an internal refugee problem uh, of people who not only are not likely so easily to come back to their homes, uh, in, in many cases the homes are also not there because of, of the operations, and um, of course, it's nothing compared to, to the refugee problem in Gaza. I don't want these are five stars refugees compared to, to, to the people in Gaza. But yet, it's it's a, it's an economic burden. Of course, the U.S. gives money all the time, but there will be a limit to that as well. So the lack of social cohesion, the militarization of the society, uh, the economic uh, uh, acute economic uh, uh, crisis. Imagine if to all of that you add sanctions from the outside, for instance, or a more indifferent American position. Uh, so there are indications that it would be very difficult to uphold such a state in the future, especially that the only message mainstream politicians in Israel is giving to their society is that the future is another war and another war, more violence, more bloodshed. There's no offers of horizons of reconciliation, normal life, uh, you know, and, and so on. And, and uh, that also is something that impacts, of course, those people in Israel who have the ability to leave uh, or just to partly live in Israel, uh, if that is the, the future for their children and grandchildren. So uh, I, I think that, yes, uh, the, these are uh, part of a, a number of indications that we might see the beginning of the end of the Zionist project. I just have to warn as an historian that an end to a project can take 20 to 30 years. It doesn't mean that it's something that we envision for tomorrow or the day after. For many years, I claim that the two-state solution is dead. Uh, and uh, just people don't want to admit it. I don't think that, first of all, practically, I don't think it's possible to have a two-state solution anymore for two reasons. What, one is the, 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 the effects Israel established on the West Bank. It Judaized it in such a way that uh, uh, it, won't, it won't be able to, to take out enough Jews from, from the West Bank to even create a mini Bantustan, a proper mini state there. That's one thing. Uh, the one practical thing. The second uh, practical thing is the vast majority of Israelis don't want a two-state solution. They believe they, they have the power to rule directly or indirectly the whole of uh, historical Palestine. So I think uh, uh, given the fact that also morally this is not the right solution because it doesn't include all the Palestinians and it doesn't include all the Palestine, given that it's both morally and practically invalid uh, solution, uh, I think that despite the international support for it, and I'm not undermining, underestimating the international support, but despite that support, I think it's time to think about a different solution. I'm part of a movement in Israel and Palestine called uh, the One Democratic State Initiative. We are not a political movement. We just want to raise, especially among the Palestinians, uh, the need to support uh, uh, once more, the one-state solution is a, as the goal of the Palestinian Liberation Movement to put it forward as the only uh, reliable solution uh, for the future, which will, by the way, to my mind, is a win-win for everyone, not just the Palestinians, but also for the Israeli Jews who would be willing to live in a non-Jewish, non-Zionist state. They will have a much better and much more uh, normal life uh, than they have now, despite all the privileges that the apartheid state of Israel grants them.